Bem, bom dia a todo mundo. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Carolina Rossini. I lead the global work at Public Knowledge. Uh, it's a non-profit based in the US, a watchdog for net neutrality, open internet, access to knowledge, and more. Uh, I'm from Brazil originally, uh, and I'm very proud to, to have the IGF back in our country. Our panel is going to deal one of the most complicated and, and old, I think, discussions in this world of technology, which is copyright and copyright reform and balanced copyright. And we were very lucky to have incredible representation from sectors here, so I'm very proud. And I thank you, my colleagues, and I thank you, my co-organizer, Stuart. Raise your hand, Stuart, from the International Federation of Librarians, and Cristiana Gonzalez, where is Chris? I think she's being our remote moderator. Thank you, Chris, uh, to help put this together today. Um, so there is a lot of uh, evidence vacuum in a lot of discussion of copyright. So uh, even with a lot of companies and sometimes countries trying to find evidence, and even academia, uh, Carlos Afonso, for example, participated in a, in a research in the past with IDRC on uh, what piracy represents for economy, the good and the bad of it. Uh, we are still have a lot of questions that were not answered yet. So I think I pose the challenge for our panelists, and I would love to call them provocateurs instead of just panelists, to think about this today. Um, so this discussion, we're going to go in a certain order, and I ask the panelists, the, our provocateurs, uh, to actually refer to four main questions. So in their four minutes, four to five minutes, they're going to refer to them. Do the rules, as they exist in specific countries, add to or detract from economic growth? Do the copyright rules, right? Is the copyright system strengthening internet potential to boost economic growth and promote cultural diversity and how to balance those? How copyright reform could be an incentive for economic development in developing countries and least developing countries? Is it possible to achieve balance between all those interests, including internet users, right holders, and internet companies, ISPs, etc.? So these are some of our core questions that have haunted, hunted and actually inspired a lot of us to work in this field. So I want to start with uh, uh, José Vaz. He's from the Brazilian ministry, so bear with us. I'm going to have to do some form of simultaneous translation here because this room doesn't have simultaneous translation. And then after that, we're going to move forward. Um, thank you, José. Good morning, bon dia, and my apologies because my spoken English is so weak, but Carolina will have help me. Um, então, respondendo as questões, é, as questões todas podem ser resumidas em uma só, eu creio. São quatro perguntas que podem se reduzir a uma. É, em que medida a regulação do copyright, do direito autoral, pode favorecer ou não o crescimento econômico e a promoção da diversidade, né? So what he's suggesting is that the questions we have posed can be summarized in one question, which is in what measure uh, uh, copyright and regulating copyright can serve this distinct interest of promote economic development and diversity. Eu é, responderia até re, iria refazer essa pergunta, né? que eu acredito que a, o, o copyright pode sempre proporcionar o crescimento econômico. A pergunta seguinte é, em benefício de quem? Uma regulação ela pode beneficiar monopólios ou pode beneficiar um conjunto de atores mais amplo. Assim so, como and he has a regulator, he works at the Ministry of Culture in Brazil, which is the responsible for copyright reform here right now, has a, a very important question to answer, which is which audience we need to address? Uh, what are the benefits? And uh, is it uh, society or companies? Who is our uh, audience? E a outra questão é que a regulação, ela pode favorecer o acesso da sociedade à educação, à cultura, ao conhecimento, à informação, ou pode dificultar esse acesso. Então, assim, todas as possibilidades existem. And the regulation 
can uh, actually facilitate access to knowledge or create barriers to access to knowledge. So we have to be very careful when we develop regulation. E nesse sentido, o Ministério ele pensa em dois sentidos. O primeiro é que a chamada agenda digital do copyright, existem alguns tratados internacionais na WIPO, na Organização Mundial da Propriedade Intelectual, que nós entendemos que eles envelheceram muito rápido. A evolução da internet os tornou, eles têm seus méritos, mas a evolução da internet rapidamente os tornou anacrônicos. In this sense, uh, the Minister of Culture in Brazil uh, sees this problem in two senses. The first one is regarding what uh, Brazil calls the digital agenda of copyright. And by this they refer to work done at the WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva, and they think that the treaties that have dealt with technology are already old because internet and technology move so fast. E um outro aspecto é o que se refere às limitações e exceções ao copyright, ao direito autoral. And the second aspect is that one that refers to exceptions and limitations to copyright. Historicamente nós trabalhamos com uma regra conhecida como a regra dos três passos, que é uma regra interessante mas que ela vem sendo interpretada ainda é, pensando o ambiente pré-internet. And in, in regard to the exceptions and limitations of uh, framework, what they take in consideration is the three steps test rule. Um, and é que ela vem sendo interpretada. Oh, yeah. And they, uh, the unfortunate thing with the three steps test is a very difficult rule to interpret, and a lot of countries are interpreted in a very restrictive way. Nós acreditamos que é preciso construir uma nova interpretação, menos restritiva dessa regra, para que ela se adeque à realidade do mundo que nós vivemos hoje. And he believes that we should uh, get to, uh, come together to rebuild the interpretation of the three steps uh, test in a way that facilitates uh, better exceptions and limitations. Tem mais tempo? Tem mais um minuto. É, nesse sentido, as nossas iniciativas são tanto no plano nacional quanto no plano multilateral. É impossível pensar esses temas fora do âmbito multilateral, uma vez que a internet não reconhece as nossas tradicionais fronteiras. And it's very important, and Brazil thinks uh, of that in two uh, levels, at the national level and at the multilateral level. Uh, he doesn't think we can do differently way because uh, technology does not know barriers. Nesse sentido, nós temos no plano interno incentivado uma discussão para a revisão da nossa legislação é, interna e no plano internacional com uma atuação na OMP, na WIPO, é, que inclusive no mês de dezembro nós apresentaremos um paper propondo uma rediscussão da agenda digital da OMP para o próximo ano. And, uh, the current actions in Brazil leading with this national and multilateral level. Uh, in, national is the copyright reform uh, that has been going on for many, many years. And also at the international level, at the WIPO, at WIPO, uh, where Brazil is going to present a paper in, December, in the December meeting uh, assembly uh, to actually review the digital agenda of WIPO moving forward. So thank you very much. Okay, so now uh, I would like to give the word to Catherine Oyama from uh, Google. Uh, she's based in Washington, D.C., if I'm correctly. Excellent. Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Katie Oyama. I work for Google. I'm based in our D.C. office, and I focus on um, largely on copyright policy and law. So. Um, I guess just starting off kind of with a broad perspective, you could imagine some fictional country that's building out a copyright regime for the first time, and they're pursuing this uh, reform with a, a lens of how do I preserve a specific way of doing business? You know, how do I use the law to um, maybe preserve a certain uh, way of distributing content? 
And um, sometimes traditionally, you know, in this fictional sense, it's been a very small universe of copyright lawyers, very specialized. You know, even in Washington, there were times when it was uh, a table of people that would kind of sit and hush out um, these types of proposals. I think something that's happening today all over the world that's very encouraging is a broadening of the participation and the stakeholders in this process to really reflect policies that um, reflect the interests of authors and creators and innovation and um, online platforms, users that want to access content. And I think countries do best when they're kind of working backwards from the perspective, not from that fictional model of how do you preserve one way of doing business, because that shouldn't really be the purpose of copyright, but really starting kind of from a first principle of how, how can a country establish law and policy to really encourage creativity? And that's really the purpose of, of copyright. Um, and so just in the short time that we have, I wanted to flag a couple ways that, that we've learned kind of through our experience, certain features um, in various countries that have really kind of helped promote creativity and innovation. Um, we're happy to say, you know, thanks to the internet, we have seen an explosion of creativity. Um, across a variety of platforms today, you know, all around the world, more music being produced, more books being written, um, you know, more films being created, more users able to access, and really barriers to entry for media and for content creation falling because of the internet. So today, things that can happen um, all around the world that were never possible probably even 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, you can have uh, a young person who records something in their home, in their bedroom, in their bathroom. They upload it to the internet. They can reach a global audience. On our platforms, for example, on YouTube, uh, there's a billion, uh, a billion users that will come. And so if you have compelling content, you can reach an enormous audience. Um, companies like Facebook or Twitter or Google, um, YouTube, Pinterest, they will all tell you that Protections for online platforms and copyright systems are crucial. So when you have user-generated content, making sure that platforms are not going to be sued or made liable just for what one user does, that's incredibly important. I think having a balanced system that has rights as well as fair use um, that all of digital platforms are now relying on is also extremely important. Fair use can be both commercial and non-commercial, and also I would say very simple and clear rules. So you want to encourage brand new companies, startups that have just a couple of people uh, to enter markets. So having simple and efficient licensing through copyright, not super complex, not the kind of legal uncertainty that will uh, create a lot of fear, but to actually encourage a lot of people to have a great idea and go to market. And then over time you can build more sophisticated tools um, has been tremendously useful. So I'm sure we'll come back to more ideas, but I think uh, preserving safe harbors, being flexible, having fair use, and not having an incredibly scary uh, system is, is always helpful. Thank you so much, Kate. Now I would like to invite Paolo Lanteri from WIPO to speak. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'll, I'll take the, the question regarding balance. And I would like to start with, uh, with li linking it with, uh, with uh, the, the intervention of, of, of Catherine that we just heard, that we are not here to hide that the system is actually, uh, uh, is actually facing some challenges, of course. But on the same time, we have to recognize that uh, there are also uh, so many opportunities that have been taken by industries that are offering uh, uh, unimaginable service on services only a few years ago, and the, the, the user's freedom in accessing content, which is uh, as rich level that were absolutely unimaginable only a few years ago. So the thriving uh, market that uh, we have just we just heard about is uh, is happen within the current framework. This is a fact. So we have this framework. It's challenge, but it's also in some way functioning as well. And I would be really be interested in knowing uh, uh, the proposal of uh, Brazil uh, about reforming the digital agenda. As far as uh, I, I know, uh, the digital agenda in WIPO 
is, if we can still call it digital agenda, is run and managed by the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights, which the organizer of this panel has asked me to refer to in, in one second. So I'll leave it to that. But philosophically, we can debate whether the system is already fit for the purpose of striking the balance, whether the current flexibilities enable countries to have a long uh, space, a large space of uh, free uses, for instance, uh, what, what is happening in, in the US, but also in the European countries like in the UK, where you have a long list of limitation exceptions that are actually tackling some of the challenges posed by the digital environment. So the three-step test rule uh, is in a way functioning. It can be maybe made better, but we have to recognize that some results have already been achieved through, through that, uh, that rule. Uh, the organizer asked me to move uh, to some more practical uh, um, analysis of what uh, uh, can be a practical process uh, uh, towards which we can uh, uh, reach a balance. Uh, if I can ask uh, the, the, my slide on the screen, that would help me a little bit to guide the discussion. The first remark about uh, if we want to discuss about uh, a possible copyright reform is that uh, we have to discuss first if it's needed or not. As we know, the corporate system does not lay only, uh, lie only on, on, uh, on, on law, but there are other issues very important, like enforcement and management. Uh, law is only one piece of the puzzle, and uh, the, first answer we to, to, to the first question we need to answer is whether we need a reform. Imagine, uh, for time's sake, that policymakers agree that we need to modify the international framework, then I would see uh, WIPO as the ideal forum to strike the balance. WIPO is a very open uh, uh, organization that uh, has more than 300 uh, NGOs represented. All of them have free access to the docu working documents, uh, have freedom to speak uh, at our meetings. WIPO has 188 member states, majority of which are developing and least developed countries, and they play a very important role and they are more and more engaged in the copyright agenda of the organization. So having said that, if we look at uh, the screen, uh, this reflects a little bit how the system is structured. So there are some initiatives that are uh, focused on a legislative reform, a norm setting reform, and those are the one in the agenda of the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights. The crucial, one of the main element of the agenda is actually limitation and exceptions. The more mature topic is limitation exceptions for the benefit of libraries and archives. There are a number of uh, uh, useful working documents and, uh, and studies that survey the situation all around the globe. Uh, to be uh, frank um, and to be realistic, I think the political situation in the committee, uh, as reflected in re recent years, uh, does not allow us to be too optimistic I in, a, in a quick solution uh, of this, uh, in a quick uh, closing of this item in the agenda. In fact, in the last three SCCR meeting, member states could not agree on future work on this topic. Although there is a clear interest, m m vast majority of countries uh, agree that it is an important topic and this is reflected I in our agenda. To close, I would like just to mention that there are a number of other improvements that can be achieved without touching the law, and this is like in the context of management or improving legal offer, uh, offer uh, improving how collective management is working, improving documentation and identifiability of content, and WIPO is very much engaged also in these, in these areas. So with that, I think I close, and I'm sure there will be question on my intervention. Thanks. Thank you so uh, thank you so much Paolo and uh, uh, I uh, if the panelists do not address the three step test uh, explain what it is because I'm it's a very technical term uh, I can do at the end but maybe Carlos Afonso can do it too um, but now moving forward uh, we have Cristina del Castel uh, from IFLA uh, that is uh, which is the International Federation of Librarians and have been working tirelessly on implementing the development agenda and also fighting for exceptions and limitations for librarians around the world. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Carolina, for that introduction. So I'll, I'll touch on a couple of things that Catherine, uh, on the clarity of law and Paolo on the, uh, the work of international reform. 
So in countries that have a system of copyright exceptions already, we have certain areas of ambiguity that can distract, detract from economic growth. And one of those is text and data mining. So we can take Europe as an example here. Text and data mining analyzes a body of existing knowledge to generate new knowledge. And it can improve the performance of science by speeding up new discoveries based on using existing literature without looking to laboratory-based research. However, researchers can't actually take advantage of these opportunities or any of the advantages of economic growth in big data without clarity on whether this work can be undertaken within an existing copyright exception. In other countries, we have no copyright exceptions and limitations for libraries for research. There are 32 countries, including Brazil, uh, based on the WIPO study done by Kenneth Cruz that don't have exceptions in these areas. So in these environments, a librarian photocopying or scanning an article for a user is breaking the law. You can imagine that when we can only conduct research when a physical building is open and we have access to a physical book, we really aren't taking, taking advantage of the economic opportunities of the internet. So is copyright strengthening internet's potential to boost economic growth and cultural diversity? Well, in a digital environment, most of what libraries and researchers are dealing with is licensed content. And this is putting barriers in front of access to knowledge. Content becomes more expensive every year, and the cost increases exceed the rate of inflation. So generally, the, the cost increases for a, a journal database are running at 10 to 15% in Canada, where 1% would be the, the rate of inflation in that country. These publishers have substantial profit margins. They're, they're making money off of this proposition. The other side of the high cost of licensing digital content is that libraries have less money for local content. Ebooks published by multinationals in North America cost as much as $100 per copy to lend to one user at a time, where a print book cost $15 for a library to buy with the same ability to lend. If libraries buy multiple copies of $100 books, over time their collections get narrower instead of more diverse. So although the internet and digital content has enormous potential, the restrictions of the licensing environment are reducing diversity for content through traditional publishers. And then a question of incentives for economic development in developing countries. Creators build on the work that's come before them, and they rely on exceptions for access and use. Fair use and fair, fair dealing systems create that potential. Limiting copyright terms so that work enters the public domain at life plus 50 years, for example, and ensuring that copyright, uh, that contracts don't override exceptions that are put in place by legislation are important elements. And we can see the recognition of the need for exceptions and limitations when we see where the support for this work is happening at WIPO for libraries, archives, education, and research. It comes in international forums from developing countries, from the Latin American region, from African countries, and from India. These are places where the potential of copyright exceptions and limitations are recognized, and, and those countries are, support very strongly those opportunities. I believe that it's it is possible for us to achieve balance if we have strong voices to support users, creators, and the public domain who can explain how to balance their interest against voices that have far more money to spend in their efforts to sway policymakers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Anne. I don't want to spoil some of the optimism in the room, but uh, with the uh, trade um, the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement coming into force, just approved and pu a couple of weeks ago and being <laughs> published a week ago, the average of copyright protection is now 70 plus, it's not 50 plus. So please don't just bother WIPO, keep an eye on trade agreements. Um, so now we have Emila from APC uh, bringing some news from the copyright reform in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, and um, uh, hello, everyone. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, so in South Africa, uh, the Copyright Amendment Bill uh, has been released against the backdrop of uh, the National Draft Intellectual Property Policy, uh, which, is, uh, which aims to deal with the fragmentation uh, 
uh, in the coordination of all matters related to uh, intellectual property in South Africa. I'll not really talk much about the bill, but um, what we have done as APC in, in, in relation to uh, responding uh, to that bill. And I'm sorry, I'll uh, go through my notes like reading because English is not really my mother tongue and I'm not sure you will be able to translate my mother tongue. <laughs> Um, and we don't actually have copyright in my mother tongue. I don't know how to say it. But anyway, um, a high level uh, of copyright protection is crucial for intellectual creation uh, because copyright ensures the maintenance and development of creativity in the interest of authors, producers, and, crea uh, and the creative industry. And it also protects you and me um, and the public, you and me, a rigorous and effective system for the protection of copyright and related rights is necessary to provide authors, artists, uh, creative, cre creatives with a reward for their creative works. The publishing sector creative industry makes an important contribution to the South African economy and to the African economy. But if you look around the room, there are not so many Africans here because copyright, I think we need to put it on, on the agenda and, and discuss why it's important and uh, what, what challenges or, um, that it brings. Copyright is also a policy in line with the imperative to foster progress and innovation. But existing copyright laws, not only in South Africa, but in Africa have traditionally attempted to strike a balance between ensuring a reward for creativity, investment, and and dissemination of knowledge. And one of the speakers has talked about balancing of rights. But we should acknowledge that the notion of balancing of rights is problematic, similarly to it being problematic when it's applied to balancing of security and rights and privacy, monitoring and interception. It often boils down to the balancing of interests of the powerful with the weak, the voiceless and those with the big voice, the big tech companies and some of us who don't even own anything. Powerful artists and performers versus those who are just starting out. How do we reconcile this? How do we level the playing field? For some, copyright is a route to wealth, but whose wealth is it? That's the big question for me. Where is the money going to? Is it going to me, the person who is starting out, or to the big tech companies? As I've said already, balancing of rights is pro problematic. Libraries and the legal experts, lawyers versus large entertainment companies cannot be balanced very easily. And balancing of, of rights in South Africa and in, in Africa in general is, is, lies at the very essence of the role of government, which is to save the interests of me, the citizen. There are issues that we need to consider in Africa uh, and include you know, looking at the constitution versus copyright laws, um, protecting the right of people to use their own language to participate in cultural life. And there's also a need for us to, I think, to consider that as Africans, we are an oral society. How do we ensure that there is access to, to knowledge, not just text, textual knowledge, but to oral knowledge as well? I'll just stop here, and then we can add as, as we go. Thank you so much, Emilia. I think uh, the case of South Africa and, of course, the, co the work of APC is crucial for this. You guys have been doing great work on copyright reform in South Africa, showing a lot of possible ways to balance pro, uh, uh, also like to balance among the stakeholders. Uh, but now, uh, to, to close uh, our panel, I would like to invite uh, Professor Carlos Afonso. Um, uh, he's a, a, a dear colleague from, from many years, and he's actually one of, one of the co-founders of the uh, um, Institute of Technology and Society in Rio de Janeiro. Um, so welcome, Kafi, and thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks, Carolina. Um, and I really have to say, um, I'm, I'm certainly like a, a sudden uh, addition to this panel, so I'll be, I'll be very brief. Uh, I believe in tackling the, the topic of this panel, which is how to how to envisage how uh, copyright reform intertwine with internet economy, I would like just to highlight three issues uh, for us to pay attention on, and a couple of them have already been uh, mentioned in, in, in the panel. One of them, it's sometimes a more technical one, but it's important for us to not lose sight of it, is the revision of 
contracts and how copyright contracts, especially when deals with uh, related neighboring rights, sometimes can empower companies in retaining rights that end up like locking uh, in music content in the power of a, this one specific company and that's definitely can uh, generate a certain reframe, a certain uh, hindering of the circulation of a specific uh, work, of a specific creation. So this is something that needs to be addressed. And this is uh, one thing that I know for sure that under the Brazilian copyright law reform is one of the key issues, especially because um, if we look at the changes that the Brazilian law has been going through the last decade when it comes to contract law, it's interesting to see that copyright law when it comes to contracts looks like an island that is not being reached by all the changes in terms of, princip of principles regarding contracts that you see in other areas of private law, of civil law. So this is one thing. The second point that I would like to raise attention is the one that has been uh, uh, tackled uh, right over in this panel is the, the broadening of the limitations exceptions and the attention on, on fair use uh, clauses. And that's something that, again, the Brazilian copyright reform has been paying attention on for a long time, and, and uh, Vaz has, has mentioned that. Of course, this is probably the first issue that comes to mind when you think about internet economy and copyright reform, just how to uh, engineer a uh, situation in which uh, copyright uh, limitation exceptions end up enabling people to create and to distribute their contents uh, more widely. And maybe Brazil could serve as a good example because since our copyright law has been so restrictive when it comes to limitations exceptions, like uh, as a wise man said in the, in the movie Jurassic Park, life will find a way so if the copyright law does not give the solution, things will happen. And then maybe that's one of the reasons why Creative Commons has been so successful uh, in Brazil since its launch. And, and Carolina has mentioned that we have been working for quite some time. And Creative Commons has been uh, one of the issues that... Uh, Thousand <laughs> three, right? Yeah, <laughs> well... Know, Ronaldo, uh, Kathy, a, a lot of people in this room. <laughs> been a long time. <laughs> and, and definitely like... Uh, so we have contracts and we have limitations and exceptions that sometimes being so restrictive in the law creates some alternatives or a good ground for alternatives to, to emerge, such as Creative Commons. And just, this, just to conclude, the third point is intermediary liability. And just to tackle how interme internet intermediaries liabilities is something that uh, needs to be stressed on. We have the whole discussion in the US uh, regarding uh, the DMCA and the notice and, uh, and take down procedures. And I really have to say, in Brazil, we have uh, enacted the Internet Bill of Rights for Brazil last year. Copyright is not there, as, as, as I would say, as the same happened with the, the Italian Declaration of uh, Internet Bill of Rights, but that doesn't mean that uh, the protection for the authors and the creation is not there. I think we need to here put together the protection of access to knowledge and creating the, the, the ways to foster access to knowledge together with mechanisms to protect the, the author's rights. So what the Marcos review, what the Brazilian Internet Bill of Rights does, is to say that Whatever happens with the copyright reform, whatever solution Brazil end up uh, creating for uh, intermediary liability when it comes to copyright, it needs to address balance with freedom of expression. And that's really important for the Brazilian context because the Brazilian Internet Bill of Rights, even though does not talks about very largely on copyright, it says that whatever solution comes out, it needs to balance with freedom of expression. I believe that's a huge progress. So those are the three points I would like to su suggest for for the comments and thanks for that. Thank you so much, Carlos. And now um, uh, we're gonna open for questions and participation from the audience. Uh, we already have a woman that, there that I admire profoundly. So if you haven't met yet, her yet, you should meet her. Uh, Julia Reed, uh, she's part of the, let me be sure I'm getting, the European Parliament, but one of the wonderful things she ha has been able to do there as a, a young uh, representative is to actually push forward the copyright reform in Europe uh, by drafting a report that she can talk uh, a little bit about it on cross-border cultural exchange facilitated by the internet and what is the copyright system we need for that. So thank you, Julia. 
Thank you. Um, so I'm the only representative in the European Parliament uh, of the Pirate Party, so to stay within the uh, Jurassic Park analogy, I suppose I'm the T-Rex. Um, <laughs> So uh, w what is happening in the European Union right now is quite interesting because the European Commission has uh, announced this copyright reform as exactly an economic measure. So uh, the, the goal of the reform, uh, which is part of the digital single market package, is uh, to, to enhance economic growth and uh, to uh, make the, the exchange of, of culture and knowledge across borders easier. And uh, the European Parliament in the report which I drafted that was uh, adopted this summer has actually expanded on, on this uh, economic focus and has also uh, um, uh, highlighted some uh, points that are important for fundamental rights and for development, particularly uh, the, the uh, legal protection of the public domain uh, against private appropriation um, uh, and also some consumer rights aspects such as the right to interoperability to um, uh, be able to, for example, play uh, uh, content that has been bought online on, on different uh, devices and platforms to also make sure that there's uh, competition in the market. Now, uh, since this report has been adopted with a broad majority, we have learned a little bit more about um, uh, the plans of the Commission and I think uh, the good news is definitely that uh, the question of uh, libraries and archives and uh, of education is very high on the agenda. So these are exactly the kind of exceptions where we will see movement but at the same time for me it's quite difficult to understand that if the Commission recognizes that within the European Union uh, res uh, exceptions for research libraries education are good uh, for economic development and trade why would it think that uh, outside the European Union this would not be the case so I think this is definitely something uh, that should be explored also in WIPO uh, in the future. And I think uh, just one comment on, on the broader theme, because everything we do in the European Union has to be in the framework of the international laws. And uh, if I could pick one of the, the limiting factors there, I think something that we really ne do need to um, uh, come back to and reconsider in the digital age is the question of no formalities, because this was really designed at a time when registering a work was very difficult, and nowadays with the internet we have new possibilities for that, and uh, I think it's good to look into this also uh, uh, from a question of voluntary registration of works and how we can uh, improve the findability of rights holder information. Thank you so much, Julia, for this uh, brief intervention, uh, and thank you for your work in the uh, EU. Uh, so please, folks, go ahead. Uh, I'm going to start. Uh, I see that we, we have a longer line, and thank you for that, guys. So I'm going to probably give you around a minute each so to pose your questions and comments. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, my name is David Hughes. I've spent my whole career in the music industry. Many of my closest friends are musicians and songwriters. So copyright is very close to my heart. Okay? I have very strong opinions about copyright. I think it's a little bit ironic that everybody here has quoted Jurassic Park, a movie that would have never been made without copyright. <laughs> Nobody is going to invest $200 million to make a movie if they don't expect to get their money back. So we should start with the points by the uh, eloquent lady, Emmy, from South Africa. I absolutely agree with her. I want to go back to one point that Katie made, which was the explosion of content on the internet. Well, I just read uh, recently that uh, iTunes adds 8 million songs per year. But a study that was done in the UK two years ago said that 80, over 80% 80 of those songs have never been purchased even once. So what we should really be talking about is not the explosion of content, we should be talking about desirable content. Now, I won't use the word good, because not everybody will say that Psy or Justin Bieber is good. <laughs> But, I will use the term desirable, and the desirable content comes from countries with strong copyright law. This is without exception. So when we're looking at, and I agree that copyright needs to be reformed, there's lots of things that need to be changed to catch up with the digital age. But we should look where things are made is where people can afford to invest. If you look at YouTube, for example, 19 of the top 20 all-time viewed videos are professionally produced music videos. Starts with Psy and Justin Bieber and Lady Gaga and goes down. Number 14 is not a music video, it's Charlie Bit My Finger, 895 million views or something. But that's the exception. What people want is professionally created stuff made by people who spent tens of thousands of hours honing their craft and they can't do that if they can't expect to get the money back. And the only way we have right now to do that, to ensure that, is some form of copyright law. 
I said my piece. Thank you so much. Hello. Thank you so much for that, Dave. And um, I think uh, it's important for us to, to try to find that balance. Uh, please go ahead, introduce yourself. And the noise you're going to hear is the alarm. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, bom dia. Uh, meu nome é Luan Fergus. Eu sou estudante de Direito na Universidade Federal do Fluminense. E eu faço parte do programa UCTAGF. E também estou na construção do Observatório da Juventude na América Latina junto com alguns amigos do, do programa. Minha pergunta vai ser para o Vaz, do Ministério da Cultura. É, você falou das duas iniciativas do Ministério, é, principalmente a reforma de direitos autorais. É, as discussões institucionais, é, elas pararam há muito tempo, e o projeto de lei está praticamente defasado. E eu queria saber como vai ser a perspectiva daqui para frente do Ministério, é, visto que a gente está com um Congresso super conservador, e seria inteligente ou prudente colocar essa pauta em discussão no Congresso, visto que pode até ser maléfico para os defensores de direitos autorais. E eu queria saber qual é a perspectiva do Ministério em trazer de volta esse debate, porque a lei que foi discutida há anos atrás é, tá defasada, pode estar defasada, porque a internet já mudou dos tempos para cá. Obrigado. Just a quick translation. So, um, just a quick translation. So he was asking to the Minister of, uh, to the representative of the Ministry of Culture, what are the next steps in the copyright reform in Brazil because the bill has been uh, lingering for a while. É, você tem razão quando aponta uma certa defasagem. Ah, o, ele se refere a um projeto de lei que foi concluído no ano de 2010 e que até hoje não conseguimos que entrasse no Congresso Nacional para se tornar uma lei. É, no entanto, nesse período, houve uma lei de iniciativa do Legislativo que atendeu a área da música, que o Brasil era um dos raros países no mundo onde não existia uma supervisão sobre a chamada gestão coletiva, a sociedade de gestão coletiva, é, collective societies, e passamos a ter isso. Quanto o momento político que a gente vive, que dificulta é, qualquer projeto de lei do Executivo é, dentro do Congresso, é preciso saber aproveitar as oportunidades que o Congresso oferece. Essa lei que eu acabei de citar foi uma oportunidade e foi bem sucedida. Nesse momento, tem uma comissão especial no, no, na Câmara dos Deputados que está preparando uma mudança na parte das limitações e exceções. São 40 projetos de lei que estavam perdidos, foram unificados numa comissão especial, e vai sair dali uma proposta de novas limitações e exceções. É uma oportunidade da sociedade se mexer, se mobilizar. Óbvio, da nossa parte, também vamos tentar influenciar esse processo, oferecendo substitutivos, e outras propostas para serem agregadas. Tem uma série de audiências públicas que já começaram. Então, é preciso estar muito atento ao trabalho dessa comissão, que mesmo que o Executivo não consiga ou não tenha força para uma iniciativa direta, é, nós podemos aproveitar a oportunidade que uma discussão que está dentro do Congresso e gerar uma boa solução. É... So, just to summarize what uh, José was explaining on the state of copyright reform in Brazil, um, they closed a, a draft in 2010 that was distributed uh, and it's available, uh, but that for a series of reasons have stopped moving forward. Um, but one thing that moved forward was the regulation of uh, music and collecting society and accountability of collecting societies in Brazil. Um, And uh, now, recently, uh, a special commission was formed in the House of Representatives in Brazil to actually evaluate how things are and how things should move. They have, we have more than 40 bills uh, that impact copyright in Brazil, so this commission has unified those bills and will propose a, no a new bill um, also in negotiations with uh, the Ministry of Culture. We are in a very difficult moment in Brazil with all the corruption uh, scandals that you guys probably have heard. Um, so even with the executive have been lacking force because of the scandals, uh, we all as civil society and, and observers should be paying attention to what's happening in Congress because things will start moving and there have been public audiences already uh, in that sense.
Hello, I'm Nicolas Etchanis from Altermundi Association in Argentina. We have been part of the discussion on intellectual property modification in our law system for many years. And um, our focus has um, always been on the uh, cultural circulation side. Uh, we believe uh, societies and governments should pursue common good and, and so uh, we believe that the access to culture should be the norm and copyright should be the exception, considering that it's free culture that moves the society, the access to culture, and uh, copyright is related to smaller groups. In relation to this, um, we have always seen uh, working with uh, creators uh, that they mostly need uh, protection from distribution monopolies more than protection from the public. In this respect, we all agree that we should not call piracy what is uh, the sharing of culture. And uh, uh, Thus, this one uh, little example that we always use, that is, uh, all books in the world could now be available on one big PC in every school, in every school in the world. And this uh, would be tremendously expensive in previous eras, unthinkable. But we can now do this with very little investment. And how can this not be right? Thank you so much uh, for your comment uh, slash question. Uh, I would like to ask if any of the panelists want to address that, please. Paolo, go ahead. I think, well, I can make some comments. I think uh, access to, to knowledge, uh, the broad concept of access to knowledge, is a very important one uh, within the IGF. But often uh, we, we, we forget in this debate uh, that uh, a precondition, although we understand it's clearly the connection between access and new creation, which access enable new creation, we have also to uh, look at how uh, creation is actually a precondition of access. So you need to uh, have the content that people want to access. This is first, so the creation is one. And then on the, in the debate, uh, we often forget that content or knowledge is a very broad concept. And that was already mentioned. So are we talking about accessing uh, my little nephew birthday pictures? Are we talking about uh, uh, Facebook's update, are we talking about Wikipedia? There are already a number of very well-functioning systems to access user-generated content, to access educational material, to do uh, collaborative research. On the other hand, we have uh, resource-intensive content like uh, a blockbuster video games or um, music or major uh, publishing industry like uh, news and so on that requires economic incentives to be there. So you would require an incentive to keep those wealth of books that we would like all the world to access from the same classroom to keep a wealthy environment. So we have new creation and at the same time we enable through other ways access to it. So I think we, a balance can be found in several ways through several things that can be limitation exceptions okay. and private order initiative like open source and credit commons. Just wanted to pick up a couple of comments. Um, one, there was a comment made, I think, about the music industry and state of music. So I think that's a wonderful example of how copyright regimes around the world can leave flexibility for innovation. It's uh, something near and dear to our heart because YouTube was sued you know, for copyright, uh, took many, many years to prevail, was incredibly expensive. Um, and today you have a platform where you have um, major you know, music companies uh, in deep partnership with us and we care very much about those partnerships. We've sent 
billions of dollars to the music industry from revenue that's earned. But it's not true that it's only a certain class of professionals that make use of those tools. So there's over one million different creators that personally earn revenue from various channels. And I think that's a wonderful example of when laws can be flexible and leave breathing space for technologies and platforms to develop for users and for industry. That's kind of when everyone wins and can be very uh, beneficial to local economies. Um, I think that's very important. I think also the second point that was kind of made about the promise of books digitization, you know, for us that's uh, very important. And, and I would encourage you all to think more broadly just in terms of text and data mining and the points that were made earlier. We live in a digital age and there's tremendous potential with data um, when the law leaves that breathing space to make copies for breakthroughs in healthcare, in education, in digital technologies that will grow economic growth for all. Um, but you can't have a system where one, one single copy is going to send everyone to jail, you know, uh, leaving some space there. And then I think the last point on formalities is, sounds technical, but is really key when you're looking at reforms to copyright. Um, there is a tremendous amount of confusion right now in the marketplace. So for platforms that just want to know who to pay and how much to pay so that creators and businesses can be compensated because many systems around the world uh, have not required recordation of ownership rights, can be very complicated to know when, how to license that content. And so thinking about incentives um, for accurate and comprehensive rights ownership uh, information, I think, would help kind of everyone that that feeds off of the copyright ecosystem. Okay, so thank you so much for that uh, uh, approach, and I would invite you both, sirs, to actually pose your question, uh, and then we close because we just have four minutes left in this panel, and we need to leave the room. So you two, and then the panelists are free to uh, also make their final comments, please. Thank you. I'll be brief. Alex Gakuru, Code IP Trust from Kenya, and. Creative Commons is very dear to me. Um, in order to help us challenge ourselves beyond this whole idea of copyright, because if you ask if you want to protect copyright and you say you don't, then you fall in the evil empire. But I think we want to ask ourselves, is copyright the only way? Is that the only thing that all people around the world have lived? She rightly pointed out that we don't even have the freeze for copyright because we are from the commons. We had a very good balance between what is private and what is communal. But what I want to challenge us is the notion of copyright extremism, which seems to be coming. And the idea of protecting copyright makes us lose all the good thing about the sharing. That's point number one. Number two, in terms of reform, the laws that we are implementing in our region of this foreign construct con called copyright are being manipulated from outside. It's an exclusive area that is handled by elite lawyers. It's not a course taught in universities. It's an, it's, a, it's an elective course. Even law students don't know about it. So there's a capacity issue about understanding copyright in addition to it being foreign. And thirdly, there is an IP industry, a copyright industry, where the real creators are not the ones who are beneficiaries of copyright. So we must be able to look at this whole thing vis-a-vis -vis who really benefits from this copyright and look for modalities where licensing and other means that actually reward the real creators are the ones that we are protecting. Thank you. My name is Bobby Bedi. I'm a film producer from India. Uh, I have never been able to understand this argument, frankly, because, uh, I mean, even while I was waiting here to say something, there was talk of all the books on a PC. You can put all the books on a PC and you can put all the movies on a PC. And now what? Who's going to create another book or a PC? That's a question I have never been able to answer. So it has to be a balance. I come from a country that does a thousand feature films a year in many languages. Nobody is really rich. You know, f don't count the top three or four stars or the top three or four producers. But of the thousands, nobody is really rich. They are barely managing to survive. However, they are the only industry apart from Hollywood that actually is surviving on its own revenues without government subsidies, without tax subsidies, without anything, just out of property that it creates. And I strongly believe that until we can protect that copyright and prevent its theft, uh, it'll be one more large economy of uh, entertainment that'll collapse. And it's headed that way if, if we don't follow it. And so, so my request is that, yes, there is the millions of hours of user-generated content. 
and they're free. I mean, it's, it, it is a free economy. I mean, enough people are willing to give away their copyright for free. If it's not costing them to produce it, if it's not costing, if it's something that's just information they want to share, whatever it might be, they put it out there and you can have it. But the people who are trying to make a livelihood from it, the people who are trying to survive on that basis, you have to respect their right. And you have to respect the right for this property just as much as you do for any physical asset that they might own. Thanks. Okay, um, I would conclude um, and say that I think we need to consider uh, exceptions and limitations to copyright reform, uh, especially uh, looking at uh, developing country context, contexts and interests, um, because um, not everyone has access, um, and I'm, I know this is not only for Africa, but in developing countries as well. And when I'm talking about access, I mean meaningful access. So there's need to consider um, exceptions and uh, limitations. Thank you. I'd like to just comment that from a library and education perspective, we all want a strong creative industry. It's, it's what we depend on. And library exceptions and limitations create that space for public access that doesn't require breaking the law because libraries do pay for content and in fact pay, for, pay $24 billion a year for content. So this provides that opportunity to have public access within a legal space. Yeah, I think I would just reiterate that call for looking for ways that copyright policy can incentivize, you know, legal user access um, to compelling content. Uh, if we think about kind of protection, that's someone's, you know, right, if you want to never share it or um, keep it so closely held. But I do think in today's era, there's many wonderful opportunities for sharing content and uh, new business models and monetization opportunities that are being um, innovated and developed every day and thinking about how a copyright framework can incentivize those kind of platforms um, to make sure folks are compensated is always a, a good goal to work backwards from. And I'll be very quickly just to, uh, I'll say, hatred the, the, the last words, I think, that's important for us to, to really try to craft a, um, a system for, especially looking to the internet in terms of liability that end up creating room for people to innovate. And that's, that's really important, to, to innovate and to create new works and to be protected by that, but at the same time, allowing people to have um, access to those to those works. I know that this balance is uh, it's not a topical, and at the same time, it's something that is not easy for us to grasp, but it's important for that to keep in mind. And maybe that's why those Internet Bill of Rights end up being important, because they end up laying the general rules under which we try to construe this uh, forthcoming legislations. So, just that. So, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. And as a final note, uh, I'm going to be tweeting some useful resources under IGF 2015 copyright reform, including a series of uh, studies comparing exceptions and limitations around the world if you guys are interested. So, thank you so much for coming and see you around IGF. Please enjoy, João Pessoa. Bye.